This is where Owen actually saw the front line for the first time. So he came along here, and this would be the beginning of the communication trench, down to the actual front line, which is below us, and it's all looking sunny and calm and beautiful today. It wasn't then, though, of course, was it? It was January yeah. 1917. Which was the coldest winter in living memory, and frozen, mud, wet, really awful conditions. We had a march of three miles along a flooded trench. The ground was not mud, not sloppy mud, but an octopus of sucking clay, relieved only by craters full of water. High explosives were dropping all around and the machine guns spluttered every few minutes. Sackville Street runs down here, marked clearly, which was dug down into the ground as a communication trench leading straight down towards the, uh, the, the, the front line. The British front line is here. Yes, and then... And the Germans are beyond on the high ground there. On the high ground there, and um, Owen was going to be posted into a dugout in the no-man's land in between them. Here you've got a battalion defence scheme, not secret, from January 17th, 1917, which is when Owen was here. The outpost line will be held at all cost, even if the flanks be turned. And it must be distinctly understood by all ranks that on no account must any retirement take place from any line. Good. So it's unequivocal. Owen's orders instructed him to take his men to a German dugout much like this in the middle of no man's land. Now when Owen had arrived in France he'd actually rather enjoyed it. He described the base depot as rather like a holiday camp. The experience he had here over the next two days made sure he would never use that kind of language again. Now, Owen and his men only got here by slithering through mud, which was, he said, sucking at him like an octopus. Mud that was three, four, or some places five feet deep. When they arrived here, they were absolutely exhausted. And what followed was what Owen said was the worst 50 hours of his otherwise happy life. He wrote a letter to his mother. Uh, he begins in a rather plaintive fashion. I can see no excuse for deceiving you about these last four days. I have suffered seventh hell. I have not been at the front. I have been in front of it. I held an advance post, that is, a dugout in the middle of no man's land. The sing, sing, sing of the bullets reminded me of Mary's canary. On the whole, I can support the canary better. He says, I will only tell you about this because I am never going back to this awful post underlined it is the worst the Manchesters have ever held and we are going back for a rest. But he also describes in this letter how a sentry, a man whom he felt rather guilty about, was up on sentry duty when a shell landed and he was blinded and he fell back down the stairs. And this experience sat in Owen's mind. At this point he wasn't writing any great poetry but it sat in his mind, burned in his mind, until the time came when he put it into one of his most memorable poems. There we heard it from the blast of whiz-bangs, but one found our door at last, and thud, flump, thud, down the steep steps came thumping and sploshing in the flood, deluging muck, the sentry's body. Then, oh sir, my eyes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Coaxing, I held a flame against his lids and said, if he could see the least blurred light, he was not blind. In time, they'd get all right. Through the dense din, I say, we heard him shout, I see your lights. But ours had long gone out. By now, early 1917, the Germans had realized their current lines of defense couldn't withstand another massed assault. Their plan was secretly to withdraw 30 miles to a completely new position, which the British called the Hindenburg Line. It was a system over a hundred miles long, with concrete bunkers, machine gun emplacements, and massive belts of barbed wire. The Germans tried to destroy everything between the old front and the new line to make it harder for the Allies to attack. In April 1917, Wilfred and his men were again in front of the British front line. Their job was to hold this stretch of railway line. It was under intense German artillery bombardment. Wilfred himself crawled down the embankment, found a piece of corrugated iron and drew it over his head. 
But the most horrific thing of all that happened that day was that a German shell struck the top of the embankment here and Owen himself was blown up into the air. When he came down, he realized that he was lying among the remains of a close friend, an officer known to everybody as Cock Robin. The experience had a terrible, terrible effect upon him. He wrote to his sister, you know it was not the Bosch that worked me up, nor the explosives, but it was living so long by poor old Cock Robin, who lay not only nearby, but in various places, around and about, if you understand. I hope you don't. After this horrific experience, the battalion medical officer noted that Owen was shaky and tremulous. His manner and conduct were peculiar. His memory confused, he wrote. He seems highly strung. In fact, Owen was experiencing something that affected many, many First World War soldiers. He was experiencing shell shock. Shell shock was the name given to a series of symptoms, including concussion, emotional shock and nervous exhaustion, when the body simply couldn't take the stress of intense modern warfare any longer. At first, the generals had no idea how to deal with it. Some men too ill to fight were considered cowards. A few were court-martialed. But as shell shock victims arrived back home in ever greater numbers, places had to be set up to treat them. I'm at the Maudsley Hospital to meet Edgar Jones, an expert in military psychiatry. Well, this is the Institute of Psychiatry, and the library here is part of the Maudsley Hospital, which was opened in January 1916 to treat servicemen with shell shock. And there's a book here which gives the very first paper published in a medical journal about shell shock. Um, shell shock was first noticed when? Really in the winter of 1914-15. It was a harsh winter and there were very high casualty rates. Shell shock had a variety of very tough symptoms. Tremor, shakiness, loss of sensation, headaches, general loss of nerve. What do we understand now about what actually causes those symptoms? The cause ultimately is the stress of battle, the intense feelings generated by being in the front line, the thought that you could lose your life at any one time. Soldiers are caught between wanting to do their duty and wanting to save their life. So the only way out he's got is to create, unconsciously, symptoms which allow him to leave the front line. And are we talking about very large numbers of people or small numbers of people or what? We're talking about thousands, particularly after major battles. Some shell shock units in 1916 would be admitting 150 people a day. Some of the early treatments were really harsh, weren't they? There was a chap called uh, Yeland who applied electric shock treatment in London and this was also practiced in France as well where the idea being that by applying the electric shock the pain of the shock was worse than the fear of going back to the front so it was a way of terrifying people to restore their function Wilfred Owen was luckier he was sent to a progressive hospital for officers in Edinburgh called Craig Lockhart here, Owen was treated by the innovative and thoughtful Dr. A.J. Brock. What was the therapy? Brock described it as occupational therapy. He thought that shell shock was the result of a man being dissociated from his environment, from his friends, from his natural life. So Brock encouraged him to go and explore the area, to look at plants, to meet people, to start writing again, and at Brock's insistence, took on editing the Hydra, which was the magazine of the hospital. And this, I think, is uh, an important part of his recovery and rediscovery of his old creativity. Owen's doctors didn't just ask him to edit the magazine. Realizing he was an enthusiastic amateur poet, they encouraged him to write. So now, instead of trying to blot out the horrors of war, he confronted them, and for the remainder of his life, he relived his nightmares in verse. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound, dull tunnel, long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile I knew that sullen hall. By his dead smile I knew we stood in hell. 
What happened at Craig Lockhart, the saving of Owen's sanity, was really the making of him as a poet. Before he arrived here, it seems to me he'd written very little that was of any consequence at all. It was syrupy stuff. It was really pretty unmemorable. When he came here, though, he began a period of intense creativity. He was producing six poems a week at one point. It's as if that terrible experience in France had blown his mind, and, and when the pieces reassembled, they did so as this magnificent, translucent poetry. But it wasn't only Wilfred Owen's treatment at Craig Lockhart that transformed his poetry, it was the remarkable coincidence of meeting Siegfried Sassoon. Sassoon was much that Owen had dreamed of being, sophisticated, privately educated, ferociously brave, and already a recognized poet. Sassoon wasn't suffering from shell shock. He'd been sent to Craig Lockhart in a bid to silence him. He just willfully defied military authority by publishing in July 1917 a very public attack on the government's handling of the war. I believe that the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. I believe this war has now become a war of aggression and conquest. So what a remarkable irony. The generals decide to lock up Siegfried Sassoon for opposing the war, and in so doing, put him right alongside Wilfred Owen, who is about to write, largely made possible by Siegfried Sassoon, the greatest anti-war poetry ever written. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. It was in hospital that Owen wrote over 20 of his most important poems, almost half his entire work. Sassoon helped him completely transform his style. Out went the flowery romantic language and in came brutal, simple words to show the truth of what he'd seen. Now Wilfred had not just a friend and advisor, but an advocate. Sassoon believed his poems worth publishing. He encouraged Owen to sweat your guts out writing poetry. Owen's original manuscripts showing this working relationship are now kept in the high security vaults of the British Library in London, 20 metres below the Euston Road, under the custodianship of Jamie Andrews. What do you got down here? Well, it's some of the greatest and most important documents really in English literature and history from, for example, the Magna Carta or the Lindisfarne Gospels, right through to recent manuscripts, for example, Beatles lyrics. So it's a, it's, it's a wide range. And included in that is some of the greatest treasures of English literature. Um, down here we've got uh, poems uh, of Keats, we've got manuscripts of Jane Austen, of Charles Dickens, the plays of Oscar Wilde, and just down here, two volumes poetry of Wilfred Owen, almost his entire extant verse manuscripts. How wonderful. Can we have a look? We can. The collection includes over 40 poems by Owen, including Anthem for Doomed Youth, which was written at Craig Lockhart. Over the many drafts, we can see clearly how the poem developed with Sassoon's help. Do we know what he felt? I mean, Sassoon comes along, looks at his poem and says, well, that's, that's pretty good, my boy, but I think you could improve it by just changing this word here or that word there. A lot of, I guess a lot of poets would be pretty, have their noses out of joint at that. Anthem for Doomed Youth was one of his early Craig Lockett poems, and it's one of the first poems where you can see um, the real intervention that Sassoon and the real difference mm. that Sassoon made to the poem. Here almost, he's, he's inviting Sassoon to choose. He's given two options uh, for the anger of the guns. He writes only the monstrous anger of the guns, and above it, only the solemn anger of the guns. And he doesn't decide. He lets Sassoon decide. And Sassoon's choice is fairly clear. You can tell that he's um, deleted solemn for the much more vital, monstrous anger. And then in the next line, he says, let the majestic insults of their mouths, talking about the guns, and he's changed it to blind insolence, mm. so which is much stronger, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it was Sassoon who came up with the title and who altered it. Originally, it was Anthem for Dead Youth. You can just see beneath oh. there, dead, crossed out in Sassoon's handwriting, Doomed Youth, which is... Oh, Sassoon made it Doomed Youth. Yeah, which is just so... It's, it's very significant. It's not talking about the result, that the soldiers, this youth, this generation of youth was dead, but it's talking about the process of this awful, slow, oh. inevitable, I suppose, death. Um, and it makes all the difference, the change in that one word. Owen looked up to Sassoon um, to a great degree, so it's, 
it's no wonder that he accepts these changes, and most of them we can see um, it's a good thing that he did. It improved the, and the strength of the poem and the, the power of the emotions. At this point, Wilfred Owen was unknown as a poet, except to the few who'd seen his work in the hospital magazine. But now he knew he'd found his voice and his subject. At last, he saw a real chance to fulfill that boyhood ambition to become a recognized poet.